Awesome. So I'm CB. Um, I work for Bloomberg. Um, none of the code that I'm going to show you today is uh, um, um, anything to do with any code that Bloomberg runs. Um, it's, a, it's a little tour through a pet project of mine. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, and this is a story of an experiment to see, uh, to see basically um, if I could beat the compiler. Um, so it, it talks called um, CPU optimized data structures. Um, I, I hope you kind of read a bit more of the blurb because because really it's like more fun with assembler. Um, the data structures I'm talking about are kind of like really small um, and. I, yeah, I kind of worry, it, I don't know, maybe that didn't get the essence of the talk into that title, so anyway. Um, so I, I, had a, I had a task, um, and it was really it started as um, um, a little bit of a competition. Um, so um, I have a good friend who's in the audience, um, and uh, we both had an interest in um, poker, and... Um, uh, I don't know, with these games involving kind of a lot of human aspects um, and not being very good at it, I kind of, I don't know, concentrated on the um, the bits that the machine could do, which is probably, you know, it doesn't actually make me any better at poker, but it's quite fun if you kind of want to practice a bit of pro programming. So, so the, the the task was, you know, can we can we work out which hands of poker are most likely to win against which other hands? Um, yeah, that's my presenter view. I could probably actually be here and I can see what's coming up. So um, who, who is familiar with like uh, poker, any particular variety or, or some? So yeah, quite a few, about half, but you know, I'll kind of explain the, the basics or, or the, the, the bits that apply to the problem. So um, in pretty much um, uh, every game that's called poker, um, a hand um, is five playing cards um, taken from a single deck of cards. Um, and now, hands are ranked according to certain kind of attributes of those five cards. So kind of patterns, things that kind of humans find interesting. Um, and uh, the rarity of those patterns uh, pretty much determines um, how, how high scoring a, a card is. So um, one particular um, um, good hand to have is if, if like all five cards uh, have the same suit. And that's kind of relatively rare, so it wins over uh, a lot of hands that don't have all cards over the same suit. Um, so, so the setup of um, uh, playing cards. Um, is everybody is um, everybody familiar with the kind of European standard? Um, well, I say standard. There are so many to choose from, but um, uh, a deck of playing cards. And, and, uh, know the how it's con constituted. Uh, and, uh, I hate to ask a question where somebody has to stick their hand up to say they don't. But so, who's familiar with a 52-pack deck of cards? And I'll try and spot the person looking a little bit. Uncautious. I can't see many, but I'll throw you. So, um, it, it turns out that there are there are lots of variation in, in playing cards, but this is pretty common. So you've got a deck of 52 cards, um, and each card has two attributes. It's got a suit uh, and a rank. Um, there are normally, well, in this particular setup, there are always four suits. Um, and certainly where I'm from, um, which is this country, um, England, part of the European Union, um, still, <laughs> for the time being, um, they're called spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. And this is this is thing that um, uh, seems to change most in, in Western Europe, in different countries over the century. You know, uh, some people have hearts, but they you know they don't have diamonds. They call it something else. Or the clubs are you know they're not black, they're green or something. They call it something different. Um, um, it's, uh, but, you know, four suits. Um, and there are uh, 13 ranks, um, which are numbered 1 to 13. No, no, of course not. They're, they're ranked 2 to 10, and then Jack, Queen, King, Ace, or sometimes Jack is Knave. Um, yeah, they, they kind of vary. But um, um, So if you multiply uh, 4 by 13, you get 52. So for each rank, for each suit, there is actually exactly one card of that suit and that rank. Um, so in terms of the rank, two is generally the lowest value card, um, all the way up to um, ace, uh, which is like one, which is the most valuable. Uh, but sometimes in some contexts, uh, ace also counts low. And, and this is actually, this is kind of, what I quite like about this problem is it's kind of got lots of nice exceptions. It's not some like someone said, let's make a game that's really easy for computers to score. It's got lots of nice kind of like edge cases and stuff. And that's kind of one of the things that makes it fun. So, uh, poker, yes, I've told you that a hand consists of five cards. 
Um, but that's kind of like um, how you get those cards and, and, and when you kind of form a hand is, is kind of like the basis of, of a, a whole lot of variants of poker. So the, um, one of the really common, you know, commercialized by TV, lots of prize money variants is uh, Texas Hold'em. Um, it, it's, it's, it's the one that kind of like maximizes the, the human aspect of the game and therefore is least, you know, uh, easy to completely model with computers, but um, people put a lot of effort into it because there's, because there's money in it. Um, and, uh, and so the way it works is your five, um, your five card poker suit that you're going to take and try and beat other players is actually um, not formed of cards that are yours, but it's com um, formed of a combination of cards. So generally each player has some hold cards which are personal to them and secret, not known to other players um, until the very end. Um, and... Uh, to make up your, your full um, hand of poker, you can also use some community cards, which are generally shared from all the players, so any player can use these cards as part of their hand, and they're also open, so at certain points in the game, so they're also open, so everybody can see what the common cards are. So, um, for example, you know, all of the common, you, you might have a whole lot of common cards which completely form a really valuable um, hand. And so you know that everybody's got that hand, everybody's got a valuable hand. So even if you've got some quite nice cards here, it's going to be like, well, everybody's got four aces, so. Um, <laughs> um, so yes, your hand is the best five card hand you can form from both your personal and the shared community cards. Um, and in, in Texas Hold'em, you, you generally have two personal cards and uh, five community cards. So the particular variant of the problem um, that I wanted to look at, um, basically because uh, my friend was already looking at this problem and I wanted to, to beat him to the, to, to the uh, punchline, um, was in a situation where you've got uh, two players playing against each other, and so you've got uh, two sets of, of, of hold cards. If I've got um, a particular car, um, a pair of cards, how likely am I to win once the community cards come out uh, and, and we have some sort of a showdown? Okay, so the first thing we need to know is like, how do we score a hand? Uh, kind of careful of the, the time. I don't want to kind of get all the way to the end and have taught you how to play poker and, and given you absolutely nothing to do with CPUs or data structures or anything like that. So um, if, if anyone's bored, bored, do let me know and I'll skip on to um, just slides which are full of assembler. <laughs> if you need more sleep, you can go straight to the assembler slides. So, um, so basically, um, hands are scored uh, in this order. Um, and there are some more ones um, after this, um, but basically I'm, I'm not going to have time to go into uh, every single line of assembler, so these, these are kind of um, the ones that I'm going to look at. Um, so the, the most valuable hand, and, and somebody correct me because I, I think I've, 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 I've got this correct. I, I'm, I'm not an expert at, 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 I haven't, well, I was okay at poker in that I could recognize I have won some time ago. I haven't actually played for a while. So the most valuable hand is a straight flush. Now, I actually um, described a flush earlier in, in in this talk, uh, a flush is a hand where um, every uh, card has the same suit. Um, a straight um, is a hand uh, which each card uh, uh, sequentially follows the next, but doesn't necessarily have to be of the same suit. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's five cards. Um, so that would be a straight. Um, if you've got a hand that um, shares both attributes, so it's a sequence, um, do I mean monotonic sequence? How do I say yeah, sequence, which doesn't miss a thing? Anyway, um, so if it's both a sequence and they're all of the same suit, that's a straight flush, and that's a kind of like pretty rare um, hand, so that kind of uh, wins out. Um, and then you've got um, four of a kind. Um, so, so this is um, specifying uh, rank. So if I've got four cards which have the same rank, so four aces, it's a really good hand, um, only beaten by the, the, the straight flush. Um, of course, it's a five-card hand. Uh, you can't, in a conventional deck of cards, where somebody isn't cheating, and this is kind of quite an obvious cheat because like, nobody ranks a five, five of a hand suit, you can only have four, that's kind of maximum, but you still have this one spare card lying around. Uh, it turns out that that card can be useful. If, um, if two players have got four aces, then... Uh, maybe not. So if two players have got four aces, then the fifth card that makes up their hand could determine who's the winner. So four aces and a king will beat out four aces and a queen. Not necessarily cheating, they're five community cards. The four aces could come out in those community cards. 
Um, so, um, so once we've got the kind of the straight and the flush, uh, pretty much every other hand is something like four of a count when we are talking about the, the, the number of counts of um, uh, cards of a particular rank. So a full house is basically three of a kind and a two of a count in the same hand. Um, flush and straight, I've already um, explained while trying to explain straight flush. I probably should have gone from the bottom up. That would have might, might made more sense. Um, and then you have um, other hands like um, three of a kind, two pairs, um, just a single pair of matching cards. Uh, and then the bottom rank um, hand is actually, um, it's when you've got no, nothing, it's notable in that it has no notable features. Um, and, and it's a hand that actually has um, uh, quite a lot of um, names. So uh, bag of nails, and I've told, my mind's gone totally blank, but yeah, people, people seem to give this hand a whole lot of other stuff, because I don't know, I think when you're telling poker stories, it's kind of like, it's the really interesting stuff. I had nothing. Um, cool. So it turns out, we, we're, getting, we're getting slightly towards computer science -y stuff. It turns out, um, oh, another thing I should mention is that, um, so, so um, I described how ranks are ranked. Uh, so too low, ace high. Um, suits are not ranked in poker, so it's, they're all completely equivalent. So the only type of hand where a suit sort of has interest is flush or straight flush. Uh, but if somebody's got um, uh, a flush of hearts and somebody else has got a flush of diamonds, neither one ranks above the other. Um, if you do have two flushes, the, the, the particular rank of the cards that make up that flush might form a tiebreaker, um, but, the, uh, but the suit doesn't matter. So it turns out, it always turns out, um, you have a finite number of um, hands, and we've got rules about what hand beats the other, so we can form an ordered list. You, so you can turn um, a hand into an integer score uh, that can be used to compare them, um, but you can do this in a way that's kind of like easy to determine from the card, just not by just kind of going through a list. So, so here's my example, um, which is a four of a kind, um, uh, four eights and a king. Um, and so if you kind of list out um, um, the, cl the classifications of hand, um, uh, you can kind of like, you can give kind of like um, numbers. So I'm going to um, start at the top and give a straight flush an eight, four of a kind, seven, um, and so on. I'm just going to say there. <laughs> If I, if I improvise, I'll get it wrong. Um, and, and then you can kind of look at, um, I wonder why the eight's in a different font. I didn't spot that before. Um, and then it turns out you can kind of like say, well, uh, four eights is, uh, wins out over four sevens. Um, so, so, so the um, rank that your four of a kind consists of uh, matters. Um, and then, of course, the king kind of matters because four eights and a king beats four eights and a three. Um, so, so actually, that the rank of that card also makes a difference. So, I'm going to give this hand the number seven six B zero zero zero. I'm using hex, obviously. Um, that, that's why I chose to have the king in there. So, so where do these numbers come from? Seven is the classification of the hand. I was going to give four of a kinds a seven because that's kind of where it appears in the list. Six is because. Six is because the four of a kind consists of an eight. Two being zero, the two card being value zero, three, yeah, so it's off by two. Um, and uh, king K, B, obviously the letters. <laughs> Made total sense at the time and I put it on the slides and I thought, yeah, no, it's still gonna make sense. So yes. Um, uh, 10, 8, jack, 9, queen, 10, or A in hex, king, B, and finally ace would be C. No, no, so I've got kind of D, E, F for uh, uh, exceptional conditions. So, I mean, the obvious, uh, the obvious data structure, when you're kind of like, you, you have two, um, or an obvious data structure, it's like if something's obvious, is probably missed something. Um, an obvious data structure, when you're kind of going, I've got two cards and um, I'm gonna iterate through the possible uh, community cards, is to kind of go, ah, uh, well let's kind of like um, give a card uh, a suit and a rank, and then I'll have like a, a smallish vector, I've got seven or an array, array of seven cards, um, and then I can kind of like do some, do some logic on that. And that's kind of like, yeah, okay. Um, so an array of integers, um, and generally kind of like 
the approach I took was to kind of encode the suit in the high bits and then um, encode the rank in the low bits. Um, and you can actually fit it into a byte um, because uh, to go up to ace, so two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. I'm, I haven't used all of my four bits yet. Um, and then I can put the suit, which is only uh, two bits because I've only got four of those in, you know, one up. Um, and so, like, it actually does all fit in a char. Uh, it's a little easier just to put it in a short because, like, you can take the low byte and the high byte easier because um, in the in the languages that I'm going to be talking about later and the CPU architectures I'm going to take a look at, you get like char addressing, not um, nibble addressing. Because if you did have nibble addressing, a nibble would be a char, depending on how you're defining these things. So, so one of the things I find about talking in front of people is like even if you're not talking back, I suddenly realize things that I didn't think about before. It's great fun. Um, even though I've given this talk before, it's like a different set of people, even, I don't know why it is, it just happens like that. So, so here's a data structure that's going to be easier to work with, uh, with the sort of logic stuff that I want to do. I'm going to have a per suit bit mask of cards in my hand. I'm having the same clicker problem that I was having in the lightning course. The clicker works absolutely fine, it's totally flawless, it works absolutely fine, up until you plug in a professional grade AV system into an HDMI port and, and then something happens. Um, so a per suit bit mask of cards we hold and an array of counts by rank of cards we hold. So the, um, actually there's no, array of counts by, should have been by suit actually, because this is, this is the extra, I can't believe I didn't notice that. Um, because this is the one bit of information it turns easier to just to like keep the count and then you know if you've got a flush and then you can, can do some different logic. So, so this is, there's some redundant data in here um, and I've also kind of like um, uh, got a different layout. So for example, um, and I can't remember what the suit of the uh, king was in my example hand of eights and kings. Anyway, this is the suit that has the king in. So we had... Um, um, uh, four eights and uh, a king, um, and in a 16-bit quantity, I can kind of fit this bit mask, and I've got a one-bit set for king, and I've got a one-bit set for eight. Um, I would also have this um, bit mask for the uh, three other suits, which would only have a one set in, in the king slot. Okay, cool. So we'll see in a moment why this data structure is kind of nice and, uh, and uh, easy to work with. Um, uh, but the first thing we need to do is kind of like when we're kind of iterating through um, our, our possible community cards to see what um, um, wins, it's very easy to kind of like iterate through that first data structure I had. Um, less easy with kind of the bit mask because like while you, if you know what a card is, is disappearing from my hand and coming back in, it's, it's relatively easy to like subtract one off that suit, out one of its suit, mask out this, put that back in. It, it's, yeah, knowing which card you're on and what the next one to iterate, you, as far as I could tell, just as a kind of lowly human, you still had to keep this second data structure you're iterating through anyway. Um, so it turns out it's quite important to be able to um, convert between these two. So, who is uh, familiar with x86 assembler? Ooh, quite a lot of people, but not everybody, which is fine, because like part of this talk is kind of explaining that. So, uh, quick note, um, this is actually some quite old code. Uh, it should run fine on a Pentium 200 MMX. Actually, this, this stuff doesn't even need like MMX stuff. This will probably, it's probably 486, 386, 286 maybe? Yeah. Um, so, so um, but subsequently I used um, uh, some MMX instructions which for the cool stuff. Um, and uh, this, so what I've done here is I'm actually, um, when I was encoding the uh, rank in low bits and the suit in high bits, um, I, I've split that across a short uh, specifically because I can address different bytes, otherwise I'd have to do some shifts and, and, and masks and things. And so, um, so this, this, um, this function is snippet. Okay, this is part of a function. Um, this snippet is um, iterating through a number of cards and, uh, and producing this uh, easy to work with, as I've called it, uh, data structure. Um, so uh, the first two is um, the, the first two lines are just kind of like um, um, uh, copying a pointer to an array um, and a card count uh, out of the parameters that are passed in on the stack. 
And so that's before the dot load loop. And uh, then, so that's, so if people kind of like, so, so mov is just move. I'm, I'm using um, Intel assembler syntax uh, because that's what you can read in the manual. Um, and it's exactly not the syntax that all of the Unix tools use by default, which is a bit annoying. Uh, but you can, of course, um, uh, switch all of the tools of extra options or uh, init settings uh, to use um, Intel syntax, which Intel syntax is nice. Um, and of all of the talks I've been to that have kind of had slides with assembler, um, no one has claimed that the alternative syntax, AT&T syntax, is nicer for Intel assembler. The only reason that people have given for showing AT&T syntax is because that's what the tools give you by default, which is kind of annoying. So uh, most of my code um, uh, run is I've run on Linux, um, but um, does compile and run on Windows with some different link settings. I think, yeah, I think there's an underscore issue in the function names in the mangling, but anyway. Um, so, so, taking the parameter that's a pointer to the array of cards um, off the, uh, the stack, so the bit in square brackets is a memory dereference. Uh, EBP is just uh, pointing at the um, area where parameters are after a, after a shift, because I've, I've got rid of a bit of um, uh, a function prolog where I, I've, I've saved my stack point, saved my base pointer on the stack. Um, and uh, EDX is the destination here, so that's just a local register. And the second parameter moving, that's kind of the same thing. Okay. Um, so anybody know what um, mov zx does? Yes, exactly. Move with zero extend. So, um, mobzx eax byte edx reads the single byte at the address uh, pointed to by edx, which is the first parameter, which was happened to be an int. Uh, an, well, it happened to be a. Uh, it happened to be a short star, I think. No, was it? Now, add edx comma four. It was an int star, um, but that integer consists um, of a um, little endian thing of which only the, the lower uh, 16 bits were important to me when I, I, I loaded it up. Um, so um, I'm taking the byte and I'm just putting it in a 32-bit register. And the second instruction is just taking the following byte and uh, putting it into a different 32-bit um, register. Um, and now I'm setting up these two parts of the data structure. Um, and uh, if you remember, I have a bit mask uh, per suit um, where a bit is set according to the rank. Um, and I'm keeping a count um, of cards of a particular suit. So BTS, does anybody know what BTS is? Sorry? Uh, yes, exactly. Cool. So a lot of people are learning. One person doesn't learn from that, so that's okay. Um, so it's um, a bit test and set. Um, I actually don't care about the test part of this instruction, but I don't believe there's just a bit set that doesn't also do the test. Um, so, so BTS takes um, um, an address or a, a, a location, so it could be registered on an address. In this case, it's an address, which is like a, a, a double word uh, pointed to by this long um, address expression, um, and it tests the bit indexed by EAX, which is the, like the rank, and I think it sets the carry flag, I'm, I'm not quite sure because I wasn't using it at the time, um, based on whether that bit was originally set, but because I'm doing BTS, it will then, after it's done the test of what it con uh, contained before, it will just set the bit. I'm only interested in setting the bit in this um, circumstance. So, um, I, I split, um, I split the subtraction and put the kind of like index offset in the middle because that's the way the instruction works in the language, but kind of like logically thinking at it. Um, I've got um, these four um, bit masks at um, EBP minus 16 onwards, uh, which just happens to be an, an, an area on my stack that's free for those, these sort of things. So this is local variables. Um, uh, EBX times four, so it's 
uh, I've got uh, integers, and I'm, I'm, the suit is just kind of like, I'm just kind of like um, going uh, spades are zero, hearts are one, and just kind of like moving by four based on that, on EBX on the suit index, and then setting the rank bit in that suit integer. Did anybody follow that? I, I lost myself, I think, but um, it's difficult to make that much clearer, but yeah. I'm just basically setting the one in the right one of these in a l area indexed by base pointer that's my, uh, uh, my local stack. Cool. Um, and the next line kind of looks quite similar, um, but it's just my suit count. Um, so ink, everybody from the room of ink? Yeah, anybody? Ink, I heard increment. So even if that wasn't what somebody said, yes. Um, so it just like increments the value um, at, at this address. So I've got an integer count that I'm just kind of um, uh, um, adding up. Um, and then I add four to edx. Now, if you remember, edx is that parameter, the pointer to the list of integers that I'm taking in. So I'm just moving that onto the next um, item in the array. Um, and then I'm looping. So how does this know to, where to end? So actually, um, uh, it's kind of a side. Uh, like, if you look at assembler code that's generated by um, compilers, they very rarely use loop. Um, and I did, and it seemed to perform OK. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is. Um, does anybody know what loop actually does? Yep. It decreases the ECX by one and jumps if it's not zero back to the uh, original address. Exactly. And isn't a loop a really simple way of saying that? So it, um, um, for the benefit of, uh, of, of everybody else and the recording, loop decrements ECX. So it's kind of like it, ECX is magic and special with respect to loop. Um, and if you'll see, like ECX is only referenced as that second parameter. I just load it from the parameters, and then I never refer to it explicitly for the rest of the block of code. But loop will decrement ECX. It doesn't work with any other register. And then if I hit, hit zero, it just kind of you, you just drop out and carry on. If you haven't hit zero, it's like a jump, and it'll just jump to the label that you give it. So um, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like loop. It does all of these things, which is why it's kind of like, it's almost like a high-level language, isn't it? Cool. <laughs> Not much. So uh, yeah, kind of a, a sort of slight aside. It's kind of like assembler isn't really telling the CPU exactly what to do anymore. It's much more like, like an intermediate language between um, Higher, le higher level languages and the kind of like exciting um, microcode that um, chip manufacturers write uh, to, to, to actually control what chips actually do. And that has lots of interesting side effects, like, um, you know, moves could actually be free because, like, you know, there's no, there's no such register as EDX. Like, the compilers, you know, they're, they're, these chips have got kind of areas of local things, and when they're interpreting, a, a, you know, machine code, uh, it's kind of like, oh, we'll use this as ECX for, the, for this block of code, and it's kind of like you move it to here. Uh, we'll just see if you use that later or not. And it, they, they're incredibly clever, and I... I I know only kind of, I, I've been given little views into how clever they are. Um, and yeah, it's, it's like magic. It's indistinguishable from magic. It's technology. Cool. So, uh, so with that kind of little loop, and this is kind of like my, my overhead, um, I, I've built a data structure that is easier to work for for some of the testing that I want to do. If there are any questions, please stick a hand up and, and, and ask at the, at the time. It's kind of like, it's, it's probably kind of much more, much more relevant, closer to, to, to what I'm showing than, than, than later on. Good. Okay, test for a straight. So, typically, if you have this, like, uh, an array of cars, you want to test for a straight, it, it's, I don't know, I, I found it quite difficult to come up with, like, a, a really kind of good, efficient way. You end up going, um, well, I guess, uh, I guess I look at each individual card, um, or maybe I look at the first card, and then if it's, just, oh, I'll just go from two, see if I've got a two. If I've got a two, I'll see if I've got a three. And if there's a break, I'll reset. And once I've got to five without a thing, I'll then go, yes, I, I did have a straight. And then if I get, you know, there are lots of ways to do it, but you end up with kind of a lot of iteration and testing. But if you've got like a bit mask, where you've got kind of like one set, it's kind of like, it's almost like you want to, and it, but like on a slant. 
And this, is, this does that. So um, I have a, a comment here. This is an original comment from 2006. So this project is kind of like, it's been going for over a decade. Um, but there was like a 10-year gap where I didn't touch it, uh, where it was maturing and festering in my mind. I thought, I have this knowledge. I need to share it. Otherwise, I don't know what. Um, so, um, so this function... I think it, no, it actually is a function, this one. This is an external label. Um, we'll, we'll get to, to what functions really are by the time we get to assembler later. It takes an unexploded suit. So this is just like the normal bit mask. Later on, I shall need an exploded suit. Um, a bit mask for ace in MM2 shifted left once, and it returns something with the high card set for all straights in MM0. So I'm, I'm going to talk about this magic bit mask. So what's special about ace? It ranks low as well as high. And this is crucial only for the straight. So if you have a pair of aces and a pair of kings, you do not count your aces as low. You count your aces as high because you want to win. However, if you have two, three, four, five, and an ace, you don't go... Oh, that's not a straight. Oh, shame. You count your ace low, and you have a straight that finishes at five, because that's much a more valuable hand. So, um, does anybody know what PSLLQ does? Does anybody know what the P is? Nice. Yes. P stands for MMX. Uh, it, so, so P uses like um, MMX or SSE registers, um, and it does stuff on packed data. But the fact that it's packed is pretty irrelevant for the, the next instruction. Do, does anyone know what the Q at the other end is? Sorry, Q at the other end. When, when it's over there on my screen, I have to do that. Is that right? Yes. So does anybody know what the Q at the far end means? Quad. Quad. Yes, quad word. So this code, this project is like a, a decade old, and, and there's another reason that I, no, I'm not, not hand coding 64-bit assembler, which I'll also talk about later. Um, I, I really want to. I'm going to get into that. When I have some spare time, I'm, I'm going to convert all of this to um, MD64 um, SSE SS, SE 4.3. You know, there's, there's more cool stuff that could be done, I'm sure. So, so if you take off the P and you take off the Q, which means I'm operating on a quad word, a 64-bit quantity. Are you asked with uh, SLL? Anybody know what SLL is? Yes. Yes, shift left logical. And shift left logical actually um, doesn't differ from shift arithmetic, because so it's only the shift right, I think, that makes the difference. So... Um, so shift left just um, shifts the entire um, um, register, um, the entire 64-bit register uh, left once. So I'm taking uh, my unexploded suit, which is my, my bit mask. Um, and incidentally, this straight test also works for the entire hand. If I want to test, so, this, so if I'm passing a single suit to this straight test, I will, and it returns true, I'll know I have a straight flush because I passed a single suit into it. But the other way to use this function is to just take those four suit bit masks, all them together, and then I just got any generic straight because I'll end up with a, a, suit, a, 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 a bit mask that's got all of my cards in it. So this, this, this function works both. Um, so I've taken, I've taken my um, um, thing, I've shifted it to the left once. So now instead of being in slot zero, I will have a bit set in slot one if I've got card two and so on all the way up. Uh, why do I do that? Because I want to make room for the ace counting low. So I've got this bit mask for uh, ace in MM1, which is already shifted one, which I've, it's just a local, var local variable, a local bit of data uh, later on in the, um, in the object code. Um, and now... I panned MMM1, MM0, so packed and, I mean, it's just an and. Like, who knows what and does? It does and. So and does bitwise and. It seems barely worth kind of like asking or, or revealing that as secret knowledge. Um, so now um, I've got this um, bit mask, which has just got one bit set, um, and um, I, I and in MM0. So now that one bit will remain set only if my original parameter had an ace in it. PSRLQ, the Roman legion, 
No. Um, uh, so I think we've probably, um, if you look at the, what's common between PSLLQ and PSRLQ, um, the, that, that, that middle L stood for left, and the R stands for right. Exactly. So I now, so PSRLQ is now shifting this MM1, which is just this, this single bet, which is possibly single bet, only set in the slot one up from ace if I had an ace originally, and then I'm shifting it 13 units right, so I should have, because it's backwards for me, uh, so all the way to the bottom. So, um, and then I or it back into the number I originally thought of. So now I've got my exact bit mask, um, uh, but I've got an extra bit set at the bottom so that an ace appears in two different places. Um, I, haven't, I, haven't, I haven't done any um, I haven't done any kind of tests, test and what I mean by test, I haven't done any sort of test at which I have to check a flag and then do a jump. You know, I've just, doing, I've just done things that the compiler can kind of like pipeline straight through and it's not going to kind of interrupt everything. Um, and yeah, finally I'm just moving MMM0 to MMM1, um, which, yeah, may get optimized out. Maybe the CPU will just relabel registers for me. Cool, that was uh, fun, fairly simple. 52 minutes. So I look at these slides and I've only got kind of a few to go through and actually it's, it's, there's quite a lot in there. Um, so now I'm going to do that thing where I'm going to kind of like and it with itself on the slant. So um, uh, I, I hate asking questions where, where it's kind of like negative, put your hand up. So maybe I could just get everybody kind of like hold their hand up and then just drop it when you stop following me. <laughs> but it looks like... Yeah, no, okay, don't bother. That's just to see if everybody's still awake. But it looks like uh, that, uh, <laughs> that's quite exhausting, isn't it? Um, <laughs> um, this is, this is all, it's all quite an easy pattern to follow. So we've seen all of these instructions before. So uh, we put a little one, so shift it, shift MM1. Uh, hang on, what was in MM0? It's, oh, yes, that's right. MMM0 is the same as MM1 because move. <sighs> What does the move instruction do? We got this wrong. I, I, it copies, exactly. I meant, I, I meant to do that. The last talk I did on assembly, I've done one other. I, I did all, all going to get people to shout out, what does move do? Wrong, it's copy, yeah. And I've already been to two talks on move semantics, so I should have, I should have, should have been in front of my mind. Anyway, so MM1 and MM0 are the same, um, but now I'm going to shift MM1 right once, um, and then add it into MM0 and repeat that uh, four times, because we got the original and shifted right four. Um, and so at the end of that, there will only be a bit set if there was a continuous sequence of ranks in my original bit mask. Does anybody, is, does everybody see that? Does that sound good? I see quite a few nods. Suspect if you're not nodding, you maybe want sleep, want coffee, or you're waiting for the C++ at the end. There's C++ at the end. Um, and then I have to think about this really hard. And then finally, I shift the result up three times. It's because I'm shifting right down, and I wanted to record what the high card was. I'm already kind of like offset by one because I shifted up to give room for the ace at the bottom. This works, I think. Or there may be a magic fudge factor later on. Oh yeah, because I've only shifted, I've only actually shifted four times. So one of the things is in the original position. I've already shifted up. It works in code. I've got tests. <laughs> I think this is one of the ones I, was, I, I really wanted to reason about it. I reasoned about it. I said, yes, I understand why this works after having done the, I'm off by one, I'll subtract one. It does work. Think about it. Yes. Yes, I can see why. And I've never bothered to go through that logic again because it works. Okay, cool. So I, I've tested with a straight and I've now got a bit set, um, you know, at some point which should have been the high card. And if you remember, I'm, I, I want to, a number um, that represents um, um, how, how, you know, that's in the, in the list of numbers that ranks where this uh, hand is going to score. So um, straight flush was eight, four of a kind was seven. You go down straight uh, is uh, like 
four in the list of interesting hands. Uh, so this is where this um, number with four quite in a, quite a significant position is. Um, and then I want to um, convert that I've got a bit set at the appropriate card, um, and I just want to kind of like add that number in at the right place. Who's familiar with BSR? Oh, yep, a few people. Maybe somebody who hasn't asked before. Someone at the back? There was, there was a hand kind of over there somewhere. At the front? Binary shift right? No? Yeah? Bit scan reverse. Because it's because it's just like you know BTS BSR, but it means something different. So well, actually, um, it is kind of like the opposite of, of, of BTS in some ways. It's like bit scan reverse. So what it does is it scans through a register uh, and looks for the first bit that is set, um, and reverse goes from the high bits to the low bits, and then it puts the index of that bit into EAX. Now you have to be careful to actually make sure that your um, the source for this instruction does have a bit set somewhere. I'm not quite sure what it does if it doesn't, um, but there, there isn't an appropriate, or there, it's not an obvious appropriate sentinel value because like zero is totally valid. If bit zero is set, then bit scan reverse will set EAX to zero. It's kind of like if you've got all zeros, it's kind of like yeah. So be careful. EDX has to contain something with a bit for there to be a meaningful index in in EAX. So this is essentially index of in bit masks um, BSR, trivial and easy to remember. Sure, we've seen it, but without the familiar P's and Q's. So yeah, it's um, it's shift left. Actually, we haven't quite seen it because like there's an H in here, isn't there? And they they dropped the H because in P S L L. So this is shift left logical, um, and all I'm doing here is 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 popping this um, the high card kind of next to the four basically, uh, just because that's where I've decided to do it. It's kind of strictly unnecessary because there's only one interesting kind of rank to chord, so I could have left it in the least significant bit. I would have shaved the instruction. Maybe I should do that. But then I already had tests based on a C version that were putting it in the right place. So I thought it was kind of like it's a bit cheating to change it just to like make the assembly code easier. But maybe I should have done that because there's a punchline later on. My God, I'm over halfway through. Um, cool. So. Yeah, that was, that was, so what's quite nice about this is, again, uh, no, no jumps in the testing, um, apart from the bit that I've kind of, I, I lighted slightly, there's a return here, and then I test whether it's non-zero and, and kind of jump to the, to the answer bit. But, but for all of this, it's kind of like any straight, you know, wherever it starts. I haven't kind of like had to iterate through, does it start to have a hit, a hole, reset the current type thing. I've just done, dun, 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 do some stuff. Is it zero? No, I've got a straight, excellent. So, so that's, that kind of pattern tends to kind of like, CPUs tend to just like eat that sort of stuff, you know, for breakfast very fast and then ask for more breakfast. So uh, four of a kind, uh, this is quite fun. So, um, yes, it was, it was quite fun. So um, it turns out that, you know, for four of a kind, I kind of want to see, do I have four of any particular rank? I don't really care which rank it is at all. Um, and it turns out you can kind of do this at the same time. This code would be a lot simpler um, if I wasn't targeting the Pentium 200 MMX, if I was doing something a bit more modern, like the Pentium 3, I think, because um, then I'd have 128-bit registers. Uh, but I, this is, uh, it's quite fun, so I'll, let's, let's go with it anyway. So um, the code that I haven't shown, um, which um, I'm not particularly happy about, and, and I think it's the reason why this story goes a little bit sad towards the end of the, of, of, of the um, talk. Um, the bit that I haven't shown um, takes my 16-bit bit mask um, and just spaces it out um, so that I, my, my bit mask is now the least significant uh, bit in groups of four bits. So 16 times four is 64. So I still fit in an MMX register, but now I've got a bit set for cards, which is spaced out enough that I can add things and not overflow into the next door nibble. Uh, I'm using nibble to mean half a byte. It's, I don't know how common that terminology is, but I like it and I'm using it for the purposes of this talk. So, so it takes multi-card explode and MM0. Marv Q does 
Copy, yep. So I'm copying that, so I've got two registers that are exactly the same. Um, Nibbles is just an address of some bit masks. Um, it's, a, it's a label of, um, there's a story behind this as well. Uh, it's a label of some um, uh, quad words that I can load into to memory. Um, and I, I've given the value of the two things, the one at nibbles and the one at nibbles plus eight. Um, one is 0f, 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 and the other is f0, 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 f0. Um, sorry, I missed I missed the other bit of um, thing. I've um, so I've already spaced out those um, bits into the wider one. And actually, before this function, I have done that add. So I've added those four suits together. So now I have um, a 64-bit quantity that has uh, sets of nibble-wide sums of ranks. So I already have things that are kind of like um, four bits that might be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, depending on how many 8s or 7s or kings I have in the hand. So I've, so I've done that addition. It's, it's, it's just a simple p add add um, three times. Um, sorry. So I've got those numbers, and I want to see um, whether I have four of a kind or three of a kind or something. So, so what I've done is I've, I've, got, a, I've got MM1 and MM0 exactly the same, uh, but I'm now masking out um, a different set of uh, cards in MM0 and MM1. So if you look at uh, P and MM0 with this mask, um, so it's got kind of bits set at the very lowest, so in, in the, the, the kind of zero nibble, so where two is. But I'm masking out all of the information about the sum of um, the threes, but I've got the fours, so I've got the even cards in MM0, and then I've got the odd cards in MM1, because I'm masking out the other set of patterns. And then finally, I shift MM1 down by four, so that rather than them being in the high nibble of each byte, I've now moved the odd cards into the lower nibble of each byte. Did anybody follow that? Got about half the room, and we're halfway through, so yeah, I, the half-life of, <laughs> half of following is it's not too bad. Uh, there's C++ that you can get back into, if that's what you're sort of thinking a little bit. That's cool. So, so why have I done this? This is the answer. P sub USB, basically. So what does P sub USB do? Is there anybody apart from um, the hand that is always going up because we've got a die-hard um, MMX hand-coded assembler? No, it was kind of unlikely, wasn't it? There's a practical uh, unsigned bytes. It is, indeed, a packed subtraction of unsigned bytes. And by pronouncing it P sub USB, it's kind of, that's a, that was a bit of a misleading breakup of stuff. It's nothing to do with the ESB port. So, so what it's... Um, <sighs> So if you if you kind of got like a, a register and 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 you add and you use an add instruction, generally it's kind of like when there's a, a carry it goes up and then it kind of flows up the register uh, and then sometimes it falls off the end into the carry bit and then if you use like an add with carry you can kind of like you can you can you can add arbitrary width um, integers if you have enough registers in most CPU architectures. Um, but like P for packed or sometimes I like to think of it as like parallel in the mini or micro kind of you know whatever you think. Um, sometimes you want to kind of like add stuff and, and not, not have kind of stuff like the overflowing into the next door thing. Um, so that's uh, add, with, add with saturation. So it says if you get to the top, then just kind of like um, uh, cap it at the ceiling. And with subtraction, similarly, if you subtract stuff, um, if you go too low, uh, then just cap it off. Uh, and because it's unsigned subtraction, it means if I hit zero, just stay at zero. Don't borrow from the next door um, byte. Uh, and because I'm packed subtraction for unsigned bytes, the subtraction kind of, um, you know, the subtraction of the low bit borrows from the next one, and that borrows from the next one, but it won't go over the byte boundary. There is no P sub US N, there's no kind of packed nibble subtraction. And that is why I split that register of nibbles into two things, uh, and I'm doing them separately. Now, if I 
if I was targeting something that gave me 128-bit MX registers, I wouldn't do this cunning ploy. Um, but I like the cunning ploy, so you're getting a lesson on 32-bit assembler um, targeting uh, processes that I actually had in my computer 10 years ago, 13 years ago. Um, and, and um, yeah, I'm, I wanted MM3 and MM4 to come out of the end of this um, because I need MM0 and MM1 later on. So, um, so, MM, so this packed subtraction, uh, and I've given another clue. I'm, what I'm subtracting is like one from each of these um, fields in both MM0 and MM1. So what I'm interested in is pairs, threes, four of a kinds. So, and what I had was um, just a sum of total uh, ranks in, in any slot. So subtracting one with saturation, anything that had a zero in it stays at zero. Anything that had a one in it is now at zero. Um, and anything more than that is interesting. So it's a pair or a, a, a three of a kind or something. So three, MM3 and MM4 are now going to contain something that's non-zero in a position of significance uh, if there was at least a pair there. Oh, I'm getting that pointer thing. Cool. PXOR, MM2, MM2. Uh, if, uh, so about half of the room will be really familiar with using XOR to just assign to zero, uh, and the other half of the room have probably come across the concept before. Um, yeah, it turns off XORing something with itself is often cheaper and has now just basically become idiomatic for zeroing, zeroing stuff in assembler. You can take it to C++ too, but don't. Okay, so uh, this uh, should be obvious to most people now. Does anyone want to take a guess? Somebody who doesn't know? Yeah? Yes, brilliant. Um, exactly. So, so what this will do is it will compare the bytes in MM3 against the bytes in MM2, which is just all zero. And then what does it do with the result? Well, it turns out it does something terribly useful, and it sets the entire byte to all ones if the test was successful, and all zeros if it wasn't. Um, so um, MM3 was the even cards, MM4 was the odd cards. Uh, if you'll remember, I, I had to shift those odd cards down. But the entire byte is ones. So EBX, and I should have kind of retained the comments, so, so just for the, for the benefit of everything, uh, there's still these mask values. And now what's, um, what I can do is I can do the same masking operation. And remember, the entire byte for the even cards was ones if the comparison was successful. Now only half of that byte are ones if the comparison says was successful. And I do the same thing with MM4, but with the other half of the byte. So I no longer have to do the shift operation. So, I, so I, when I took the original one, I had to shift the uh, um, odd cards down so I could do the subtraction. But because the entire byte, and I only, you know, I only need like half the byte to, to be all ones or zero, now I can simply all those two together, and I will MM3 um, contains all the information about whether I had two of a kind, and if so, in which slot it was in. So that's nice. Um, and then you're about to see almost exactly the same code. Um, as two slides ago, it's almost exactly the same. It's exactly the same, but I haven't bothered to copy the comment, except I'm, so I'm subtracting, hang on, what did I do? Yes, yes, so I'm subtracting one again from the result of the previous step, which was all zeros unless I had something interesting, which is at least a pair. If I subtract one from that count, I now, everything that was only a pair goes to zero, and stuff that's three of a kind or a four of a kind stays at one. So same fact, sub subtraction, copying it to some other um, MMX registers, um, just like kind of keeping those around, um, and uh, doing the same comparison thing, um, except now the MM4 is set if we've got three of a kind. 
Um, you can see how this goes. Do exactly the same thing. Subtract one again from everything. Do the same comparison. And I've now got bits set if there are four of a kind. So with just these ones, I've got kind of a, a set of um, three registers, um, which have got some bits set in useful places uh, if there's two of a kind, three of a kind, or four of a kind. And I can use this information to very quickly um, do four of a kind, full house, which is at least a three of a kind and a two of a kind. Actually, there's a subtlety here. A full house could also be three of a kind and another three of a kind because all of, this func all of these functions actually handle if you pass it in more than five cards. I, don't, I, I want to be able to test whether the five community cards and my two hold cards contain a, an, an interesting hand, and I will take the best hand. So actually, and this proved to be a little little subtlety that took me a while to get around in the surrounding code. It's kind of like, oh yeah, three of a kind and another three of a kind is also a full house, as is three of a kind and two of a kind. Um, so if I want to kind of store uh, four of a kind to convert that into the full thing, um, so what, what have we not seen here? Because I think trying to comprehend this line at a time is probably beyond most people's attention span and will slow me down so that I don't actually get to the C++. Um, so we've got a bit scan reverse. Um, so I, I probably I, I haven't actually kind of, there's, there's a missing bit of stuff in here. And um, MM0 has ended up um, through uh, hook and crook uh, in EAX at this point. Um, so bit scan reverse is finding the bit that was set in that register that's the, um, the, the four of a kind card. Um, MM7 is containing, like, is the original save of everything. Um, uh, is that right? Oh, yes, B BTR. Um, so so bit scan, the bit scan reverse is finding the index of the four and the kind card. Um, and then MM7, which I move into EDX, um, is the overall bit mask of all of the cards. So it's kind of like all of the ranks all together. So um, BSR. Does so anybody know what BSR is? Is everybody asleep yet? You can go home early if we're asleep, but that involves waking up again. Um, bit scan reverse, yeah. Uh, BTR, sorry, did I say BSR or BTR? I'm getting confused now. I was meant to ask about BTR. Bit test, test reset, yes. It's really cool. It's like, you know, it's all these like scan or set. It depends on whether the next one is an R or a, yeah, it's like, anyway. Um, so, so bit test reset, we've seen bit test set, BTS. There is also BTC. For a while I was using BTC in places where I really meant BTS, but it was okay because the bit happened to be zero. Bit test complement flips the bit after testing it. So, so bit set reset. So what that's, so what this instruction is doing is it's taking um, the suit mask that has something set for any card of the ranks. That was my original kind of input to, to this test. Um, and it's flipping off the bit that corresponds to the four of the kind. And that means that when I do a bit scan reverse, I, I skip past that four of a kind if it happened to be the highest rank card. And what this means is that I can find that the, the best additional card um, that might be used as a tiebreaker when ranking two otherwise identical four of a kinds against each other, and then storing that in my final value for the hand. So this is kind of like a little bit of extra logic. I've, I already know I've got four of a kind, but I now need to get all of the, the you know, the, the quantifiers, how good of a four of a kind in it is, and how good is the, uh, is the bonus card. Cool. So that was kind of like, that's quite a lot of fun. And um, those parallel stuff and, and getting that kind of layout for the bits if you know what the assembly instructions are available to you, you can get some pretty high performance, and it works really well. However, I also spent a lot of time optimizing the kind of the iteration loop. No, not optimizing. Writing it in assembler under the impression that maybe I could go fast. It turns out I was incredibly wrong. 
It also turns out that like, if you leave code alone for 10 years, compilers get better, and your assembly code stays the same. The hand-coded assembly code is the same. But the, the stuff that your compiler generates, um, as well as more warnings than it did in 2006, um, and you also you, you kind of like have to do things like, hmm, default 64-bit now. What do I have to pass in to get 32-bit code again? Um, so what is C++ best at? I found um, it was really good at like iterating through stuff uh, because I didn't have any kind of um, magic kind of bit shifty twiddly hacks that I knew the processor could do uh, that kind of gives me a leg up. I was just like, oh, I'm adding stuff and comparing stuff and looping stuff. Can't really think of anything exciting to do. And this is kind of like what, um, you know, the sort of assembler that C++ can generate is it's kind of like a lot better. So. Turns out when you kind of want to form a table, form a massive table of like, I've got this car hand, I think my opposing player has got that hand, or, or maybe there are enough mirrored surfaces around your, the room that you've invited your uh, um, uh, antagonist to play against so you can actually kind of see. Uh, is it Moonraker with the shiny silver cigarette case that Drax has that you can see the cards as he's dealing? Uh, yeah, so maybe you know what player's two cards are, but you still want to know how likely you are to win because, you know, you're that sort of person. You're, you're more about control than, than, than actually playing a game. Um, so you, you want to iterate through player one's card to generate a table of, like, how good are these cards. Uh, you want to iterate through your opponent's cards so that you know, you know, you know so you get a full table, and you iterate through the community cards to, to get that percentage of what each contest uh, results in. So how many contests are there per set of players' cards. So if I've got a given set of cards, my opponent's got a given set of cards, how many contests are there based on a different set of um, community cards? It turns out there are uh, this many contests. No, so they, they, yeah, there are this many kind of sets of player cards. Uh, so there are 52 ways I could receive the first card. There are 51 ways I can receive the next card. There are 50 ways my component can receive his first cards. And there are 49 ways that I can receive that. But I actually, I've overcounted, of course, uh, because it doesn't matter which order. I can receive the Ace of Spades first and then the Ace of Hearts, or I could receive the Ace of Hearts and then the Ace of Spades. It's still the same hand. And similarly for my opponent. Um, so, so once we, sorry, I should have shown you the number. So it's like uh, 6.4 million um, is that number. Uh, but once I've kind of like, you know, the hands could be in either order, uh, we're down to 1.6 million, so that's kind of less stuff to get through. But actually, if I'm just generating a table of what hands better, it's kind of like, you know, my, my two of hearts and two of diamonds versus his three of diamonds and three of clubs. Well, if I had the three of diamonds and three of clubs and he had what I had, it's kind of like I'm evaluating the same context, I just need to look at it in the right order. So there's no point in looking at both of those. Um, so there are actually only this many contests, uh, which is like, um, uh, well, less than a million now, I'm only kind of 800,000. Um, and they kind of like, um, uh, uh, think about it a bit, um, and suits are equivalent. So a kind of another way to reduce that is to say, and mathematicians love this phrase, without loss of generality, player one's lowest card is a spade. Also, without loss of generality, player one's other card is either a spade or a heart. Now, obviously, it can't be a spade if it's the same um, rank as the previous one, because there's only one card of each rank times suit. Um, but, and, and this does make a difference. Um, I can't say without loss of reality um, it's also a heart, because I'm looking for flushes. Like, um, if my two cards match suit, that's something. If they don't, it's, you know, I'm less likely to, to get a flush once I add the community cards. So, so player one's lowest card is spade. Player one's um, uh, other card is either a spade or a heart. Player two's lowest card ranks the same or above player one's lowest card. So this is like only, only looking at, um, uh, so if I get um, two and a three and three and a four, I won't, um, I won't look at stuff where he starts lower because I would have looked at it the other way. I didn't explain that very well. But yeah, it's kind of like um, I only need to look if his suit comes after mine in the list. The other way around, I will have already looked at it at some other point in, in, in the iteration. Um, actually, there's a couple of more subtleties that go into this following number. Also, without a loss of generality, if player two's low card matches player one's low card, then player two's high card 
is not less than player one's high card. So, so, so without this sort of generality, I could have like um, two and then a seven and then a three and a four um, and a kind of have it bracketing. Um, and, and, and that's okay in my iterate, my without loss of generality. Um, if, they, if they match, it's kind of like, I can still kind of like, yeah. It's, it's difficult to constrain some stuff that's kind of like requires a little bit of thought. But so there's some other stuff you can do here. Um, and you can go a bit further than I did. Um, uh, and there's some stuff I haven't put on the slide that does go into this next number. Also without loss of generality, if player one's card match suit, then player two's low card is either a spade or a heart. If they don't match, it's at least not a club. So what I'm doing is like all suits are equivalent, so I'm just kind of like labeling the suits. It's like, it's like a register renaming, it's just suit renaming. Um, you know, spade, you know, whatever it comes, I'll call the, your low, first low card a spade and I'll call your second card a heart. And then, you know, if I, once I finally run out, if all else fails, I'll assign the club to player three's last, player two's last card. Okay, cool. So it turns out, well, once you've done all of this, we've got down from like, you know, six million or, or 1.7 in the kind of, after some obvious generalization, you only have 48,308 combinations uh, to choose from. And how did I do this? Well, I coded up the loop and I got it to print N. So once you've got uh, player one's cards and player two cards, I might not have time for the C++. Oh, sad times. Um, once you've taken four cards out of the pool, uh, there are then uh, this many combinations of community cards, um, which once you do some um, cancellation by hand, because I didn't know, I just don't get to do enough arithmetic in my day job. Um, once you do some cancellation by hand, it's like 1.7 million. So there are 1.7 million kind of community cards for each contest, which is kind of quite a lot. And you can do the same sort of without loss of generality, except you've got lots of kind of suits already tied up. It gets really complicated. And the other really complicated thing is because I'm using the number of wins to actually kind of output a result, I need to make sure if I'm doing a without loss of generality, I count things twice every time I, without loss of generality, take out. And then you know, I have to make sure those branches are kind of equally likely that there isn't some, it gets complicated. So I didn't know simplification. I go through every 1.7 million um, uh, community cards in this. And it turns out that C++ is kind of really good at this sort of stuff. So especially if you use like templates. So I wanted to have like a score hand function, um, which I can like template on. Um, and I can do some stuff like here. So I'm just iterating through the ranks here for, for hand zero. And um, I've got this increment card function, uh, which takes a, a, um, a suit limit. Um, I then got some... Um, and I discovered actually it was quite useful to be able to um, uh, do something for each of um, uh, each hand that um, uh, player one has. So maybe I'm going to print a total. Um, actually, it's the wrong hand side of the loop for print a total, but maybe I want to kind of print what hand I'm actually looking at. Um, uh, but I did some sphinia that I'm not going to show because I'm not very good at that. And like this conference is full of people that are really good at that. You do want to learn how to do this properly for. Uh, but I was kind of interested in just like maybe if I generate the code and I don't have this maybe call thing, um, I, I, I wanted to make sure it didn't generate any assembler. And then I have a second hand loop. Uh, I bought it at a great discount. Um, yep, with not many people still with us. It's fine, it's Saturday, it's been a long conference. Or it was just a bad joke, it was a bad joke. Um, and so, um, and the great good thing about here is, is when I'm doing this in assembler, it's kind of like, oh, function call, that's expensive, I'm just gonna carry on with more assembler that does the inner loop, and I'm gonna run out of registers, and my brain's gonna fry as I lose track of what's where. But, you know, this is a template function, and secondhand loop is also a template function, and you look at this in Godbolt, and it's all expanded into this huge wad of stuff, and there's no overhead with functions calls or stuff, and it does cunning, tri tricksy stuff, and it's really good. Um, so increment card, um, it turns out you can just kind of walk up the, um, uh, uh, I ended up walking around the suits first and then up the rank, which means that as soon as I hit, um, um, as soon as I hit 13, I can always stop because I've been through the suits and I wrap around to the lowest suit. That was quite convenient. And I have this suit limit. So if I'm, you know, if it's only a spade, I it stop as soon as I reach hearts, um, Yeah, I'm having to go faster than I can comprehend these, so I don't expect you to do, but I'm just kind of like telling the story now. Um, did I click? 
Has my clicker died? No. Uh, second hand loop is very much like the first hand loop, um, uh, but I'm also having to kind of inspect um, the suit of the second hand in some cases. Um, so I have suit limit is, you know, am I going, you know, are diamonds available to player two yet, or have we not yet given away a heart? <laughs> But it's kind, of, it's kind of similar. And the good thing about this is I can kind of break it up into things and give them names and stuff. And all, it's all the stuff I really miss when doing assembler. You know, I can split it up, stuff, give things meaningful names. Um, and, you know, it fits in, fits in stuff that's mostly on a slide. Um, it's a bit dense. I, I did have to move some kind of wrapping here. Uh, what did I say that was in? Uh, yeah, this is the second half of second hand loop. Is there anything interesting here? Oh yeah, pick second hand, second hard um, turned out to be a little bit complex because it's because it's things like um, it can be any, it can be at least um, the, it's got to start from the second card. Uh, sorry, the first card of the second hand. Oh, unless I was in that situation where the two first cards match, in which case I can start it from the second hand. Of the, so, so this is like a special case, and I can put a special case in a, in a like a function that does stuff. And because it's an inline function, it all gets expanded. I'm not losing any performance. It's really good. I've got another maybe call, and I've got the common cards loop, which is looping through all of the common common cards, which is the bit I'm actually going to do the stuff on. Uh, so yeah, pick at second hand card. There's a there's kind of a bit of logic there. You know, check that we don't clash with the low card. So it it was kind of quite easy to go. Oh. Wait, no, I've already had, I've already done hearts in that one, or have I not? So it's kind of a little bit of thing to make sure we didn't like magically summon up two of the identical card, you know, the thing that falls out of your sleeve when you're trying to cheat. Um, so I have, yeah, I'm not going to have a lot of time for questions, but you think we've established that most people are asleep, so that's fine. Um, so I had some thoughts on writing Assembler. Um, it's fun. You can do fun stuff. It makes you feel kind of a bit clever and evil at the same time. Um, so, you know, you can have your own calling convention. So 32-bit calling convention is kind of quite easy to comply with, apart from a few exceptions we'll come to in a moment. Um, but you can also do stuff like, you know, oh, these two functions, they, set, you know, they have the same sort of preamble, and on this special case, I can, oh, I can just jump into the middle of this other function. So, uh, yeah, why not? Um, so I can, can yeah, because functions, uh, you, you basically have labeled blocks of code, and you can fall off one labeled block of code and carry on executing in the next labeled block of code. You can kind of like jump back, or you can kind of call blocks, and it's kind of like, sure, you can shoot both your legs off at the same time if you get it wrong, but you know, there's, there's lots of stuff you don't have to kind of comply with. Um, it's, it's fun, yeah, I like that. Uh, jump between functions. Uh, but uh, humans, well, at least this human is really bad at the, the simple, boring stuff, um, like register allocation. It's kind of like, I don't know, I put stuff in EDX. Oh, have I used EDX before? No. Have I used EDX, and it also happens to contain a useful value I might need later? Oh, well, let's use a different register, and then I don't have to kind of like store it in, in memory and get it back again. It turns out to be kind of really tricky, and, and, and I'm, I just feel like there's so much suboptimal stuff in my, in my assembler. Writing assembler is error prone. Does anybody, does anybody kind of like disagree with that? It is really error prone. It is so error prone. I really recommend getting a machine to do it for you. Um, the errors can be really subtle, really subtle. And really hard to debug. So, uh, yeah, so, so here's one type of error, a performance error. Um, so I had some, some code that was working pretty well, um, and I noticed I had a totally redundant restructuring. I was like populating this um, bit of memory from this register, never using it. Deleted the instruction, and my code ran slower. So it turns out, it turns out that um, my, my nibble mask I hadn't actually bothered to put it in the data section. It was still in the text section. And I hadn't put in a line directive before it. And it turns out that my code before, it just so happened that the data was nicely 64-bit aligned. 
By removing this redundant instruction, suddenly it was no longer 64-bit aligned. And unlike you know, a sensible Spark CPU, rather than like generating exception and dying hard, it just goes, oh, unaligned. I shall do two loads and some magic shifting, and then carry on. And it's kind of like it's not obvious, uh, but then you work it out after like an, an hour of putting instructions in, taking them out again putting a different instruction in, take it out again. You go, there's something going on here. And it's kind of like, align. It's like, it's like align and enlightenment. Um, yeah. Ah, oh, that, this one caused me such fun. Yeah, uninitialized variables, but on steroids. Uh, so it turns out, um, I, zeroing my array mostly worked. It was mostly becoming at zero at the beginning of the function. In fact, for my, most of my test cases in the first half, and then it was kind of like, and did some, uh, I tested against some results I was expecting, and things weren't right. It turned out I completely failed to zero ADX register explicitly. It just happened that when my function was called, ADX was mostly zero most of the time, except in some conditions. I think it was something weird, like I used EDX as a temporary, and uh, hang on, is EDX caller saved or call e saved? I think it didn't matter because I was in my happy assembler world while I was violating um, uh, calling conventions I right and center. So it just happened that, you know, if the previous iteration uh, was uh, like a full house or something, I'd, I'd happen to use EDX in a way that didn't end up zero, and so the score after the full house would have an incorrect uh, data. The thing wasn't zeroed, it was filled with rubbish. It was like, yeah, I, the stuff that, like, you know, compilers are really good at generating stuff that is consistent and makes sense. Um, compilers do, do lots of really useful, sensible stuff. Uh, I had another bug. Uh, my function crashed on the second call, but only after I compiled the surrounding C with more optimization. It turns out that the, so yeah, another rule, it's never the compiler's fault, especially when you've written some calling code violating assembler. It turned out that the C code, that, or the assembler that the compiler generated for my perfectly reasonable C code, it was just sending me like the value seven as a pointer. So it's like, why are you sending me this pointer that's totally rubbish? It's like, you know, all I did was combine it with optimization. It's like, it hasn't even got into the body of my function. It was giving me a seven. It's like, that's not a point. Even I know that's not a point. No wonder it's a crashing. What the so it turns out that to fix a bug where I was missing the score, um, I, I ran out of like my usual registers that end in X, um, and I decided to use like ESI as a temporary. I completely failed to remember that ESI is call E saved, not call er saved, and I hadn't restored it. And ESI, after optimization, just happened to be the register that the calling code was using to keep the pointer to the array that I was going to be sent in next time. But yeah, only the second time, only after optimization. And like the calling code sending me stuff that doesn't make sense for reasons that are, it's nothing to do with me. Yes, the, the error was like in the previous iteration in code that it hadn't reached yet on this iteration. Wow, it was, that was, that was, you can tell, can't you? There was so much debugging in that. Awesome. Is it really 12.49? Oh, yeah, and then we're half an hour later, aren't we, on, on, on Saturday? Um, yeah, yeah, that was the story. So, writing assembly code. Testing. You want tests, lots of tests, lots of tests. You want to kind of like... Call your function from different things, you know, call it from uh, functions that happen to compile with something that's called keeping something important in ESI, as well as functions that aren't keeping anything important in ESI. Static analysis would be nice, something that told me, hey, you're using EDX, and you never, you know, it's not got an explicit value yet. That would be great. I had a quick look at Google for, like, you know, um, static analysis for handwritten assembler. There are not a lot of tools out there, as far as I could see. That's fair enough. Um, but basically, kind of like, one of the most important things is, like, you actually need to have a good idea of some really cunning plan that's going to give you a performance boost, because otherwise a compiler is likely to generate better code. And here is the slightly sad story. When I did the dry run of this talk, I was able to say with utter confidence, yes, my handwritten assembler did show a significant advantage over the thing for the thing that was special. And after I fixed a bug, where it was crashing in certain scenarios, so I had to do some extra register saving, and I fixed another bug um, uh, where I, I wasn't, I hadn't actually fixed the score of a of a, um, a pair properly. I wasn't taking account of the three other cards that contributed to the score, so I had to add a little bit of extra code, um, and then I was fair to the C code. I actually. 
I found I was using an old version of the C code to compare against, and I had a slightly more modern version of the function that was, was, was a bit better. So I took my C code, and I was fair to it, and I compiled it with O3, and now the two perform about the same. And this is why I want to kind of do the 64-bit version. I don't want to be beaten. Um, I feel that I probably losing more in the bits of assembly code that I cared about less, which is the stuff like uh, converting this around, and the code that I didn't show you that was expanding that bit mask to to bit mask with gaps, um, you know, so it's spread across the 64-bit. I know I'm not doing that in a very nice way. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, the stuff that I didn't care about and I didn't look at very carefully, I'm probably losing on that. So sadly, for me. Happily for everybody else who already knows this, never code assembler by hand. Thank you.